Hello again, welcome. So if you're here, this is actually my lecture three, but um, we're chunking it up. Um, thank you, Mr. Corey. He's our person in the back who's filming. So thank you so much. So I usually start my classes with current events. Um, so it's not a, actually, no one's in our class right now. So uh, I still want to do the same format. And so there's a comedian that I found, uh, Joe Wong. So I'm going to play him. For, uh, and that will be our current event for our class for today. Gentlemen, well, by God, isn't it time? Hey, man, I'm huh? <laughs> he will be performing this weekend at Nick's Comedy Store. Our uh, uh, next guest is a very funny gentleman. Well, by God, isn't it time? Hey, man, I'm huh? <laughs> he will be performing this weekend at Nick's Comedy Stop in Boston, Massachusetts. Please welcome Joe Wong, everybody. <laughs> Everybody. So uh, I don't have uh, too much time up here before my green card expires. <laughs> See, I grew up in a poor neighborhood in China, and uh, the middle school that I went to one year decided to pave the dirt roads with bricks of cement. And the students were required to bring bricks to school and uh... <laughs> we worked really hard for three weeks <laughs> and finally we built a road <laughs> and years later I heard about the term child labor <laughs> I was like what? <laughs> those kids got paid? I got a D minus. <laughs> but uh, I read that uh, younger kids nowadays can't even read the uh, analog watches anymore. They can only read the digital ones. I was like, how are they going to report the locations of hot chicks in the future? <laughs> gonna be like hot chick three o'clock <laughs> I can't stay that long <laughs> so I came to the US for college and uh, I was really into science which really uh, helped me in the uh, romance department like, uh, once I asked this girl out, and uh, she said no. I said, are you sure? And she... <laughs> and she says to me, hey, Jill, no means no. I said, well, it also means nitric oxide. <laughs> And uh, one year, I went to uh, New Orleans for Mardi Gras. And here's something you guys should know about me. I don't approve of nudity in public. But when it happens, <laughs> I want to be there. came to the United States, I took a uh, English as a second language class, and uh, the teacher there was too lazy to remember the students' names, so uh, he just handed us a list of American names <laughs> first to choose from. And by the time I got the list, there were only two names left. So I just picked Jill. Is, 
Yes, I picked Joe instead of Jake, you know. And uh, the other day, I told that story to my son, Jake. So uh, my son is four years old now, but uh, he still has a lot of growing up to do. And sometimes I look at my son, I was like, wow, this gentleman contributes nothing to society. And I had to pretend that I am impressed by everything he does, you know? I was like, wow, you walked half a block by yourself? That's amazing. But in the back of my mind, I was like, big deal. When I was a kid, I built a road. All right, great. <clears throat> <clears throat> so Joe Wong is actually a great example of the demographic change that that uh, Chinese America has uh, has occurred. Uh, has occurred in, in America in the Chinese community. He's educated, he was getting his PhD, and very different from actually uh, the previous Chinese demographics. So if you wanna go and click on the other, uh, his, other uh, his other gigs, uh, there you go. He was actually in the, the, the presidential uh, journalist radio and journalist dinner as well, so you wanna go in that if you, if you have time later. All right, Min Zhao. All right, guys, everyone take out a sheet of paper. Take out a sheet of paper. So I want you guys to um, take out a sheet of paper, and uh, I want you to uh, write notes, and I'm going to ask you questions, and I want you to write the answer down. All right, so if you have your book out, take out your book, Chapter 2, Min Zhao, Demographic Trends and Characteristics of Chinese America. All right, the first question. What is the largest Asian group currently? What is the largest Asian currently in the United States? Okay, so write the answer, and if, you, if there's more than one answer, write more than one answer, okay? Number two, what is the oldest and largest group in America? Okay, could be one answer or more, okay? So you have your sheet of paper out, write, it, write down the answer. And number three, what, made, what act made the Chinese American or Chinese population in America uh, grow, increase by 13-fold, by 13-fold. So let's take one minute right now, one minute for you to write down the three answers. And while you're writing down the answer, I want to explain a little bit of the kind of the cartoon that you're looking in front of you. Actually, this is a historic uh, illustration. It illustrates the intense anti-Chinese sentiment that has occurred during the 1800s, uh, where uh, Chinese were uh, very much uh, the victims of racial violence. They were, in our previous lecture, we talked about how they were encouraged to come to build the railroads, but after they came, there was kind of uh, ethnic rivalry, and then here's a kind of a classic um, illustration. All right, so let's do the answers. Number one, now what did you write down as the largest group in America? Now according to Min Zhao, she says the largest group in America is the Chinese. I was looking at the census today, and uh, so please write that down, the Chinese. That is true historically, and that's according to Min Zhao. But if you look at the census today, the population census, it argues that Filipinos are actually now the largest group. So I'm going to put the answer of Filipino and Chinese as the largest Asian group currently in the United States. Okay? Um, probably you can probably make an argument there's maybe a little more Chinese, but you know I want to be as accurate now as 2013. Uh, so please write down Chinese, Filipino, but Min Zhao argues Chinese. Okay? The second one, the second question. The oldest and largest Asian group in the United States also put down Chinese and Filipino. Okay, actually the Chinese came a little earlier than the Filipinos. Uh, so the uh, the oldest probably would be the Chinese. Um, they came the earliest on the mainland, right? If you're talking about the 
you're talking about uh, Hawaii, then you're going to talk about the, the Japanese. But on the mainland, it was the Chinese. And the Filipinos and Koreans, they, they quickly followed. Now, the interesting thing, and I, sometimes I'll show the documentary the Carved in Silence, and maybe later I'll show a, a clip of that. Uh, what act made the Chinese community increase more than 13-fold? Okay. So what act? Okay. Well, it was an actual natural act, and it was the 1906 uh, earthquake that happened in San Francisco. Okay. This was a huge earthquake, huge. Okay. It, uh, we didn't we didn't have the infrastructure back then, so basically everything burned down. Like everything in San Francisco burned down. It was like a domino effect. It was all gone. But one of the things that was also all gone was the actual courthouse that held all the records of citizenship and all the records of naturalization. Well, since we talked about in previous lectures how the Chinese males were only allowed to come to the United States and later they're barred, but they're stuck in America, they can go, go back home, right? Well, that became a golden opportunity for many uh, Chinese males, right? So suddenly they had more children in China or they, had, they said they had wives in China. And so this act enabled uh, people to bring over, quote, fake children or fake wives. And actually, that's why it's called paper son, paper daughters, right? So they're, they're sons and daughters on paper only, and it was a miraculous act. So it actually brought, it, it, uh, it actually made the Chinese population go more than 10 times larger. And actually, it was a, a good thing in terms of um, demographic equ equality because it was almost 99% males, so it had some sort of measure of more females and families. So if you look in sociology, whenever there's families, it's, it's more stabilizes the community. So vice did lower in the Chinatowns. So that was a great thing um, for the Chinese community when they had the earthquake that enabled um, more people uh, to come in. All right, so let's look at a historical trend, a historical look at the demographic trends. All right, Chinese Americans are an immigrant dominant community. Why? Why are they an immigrant dominant community? Let's take one, let's take 10 seconds and write down the answer. So write down the answer. Why are the Chinese Americans, why are they an immigrant dominant community, right? Because that makes no sense, right? Because Chinese were here in the 1820s, they're here, um, some people argue even before that, in the 1700s, but, or even before that, right? But we had a large Chinese population in the 1880s, um, up and down, and particularly after 1906, right, we had this like increase 13-fold. But why is it still an immigrant population? Right? So we, we kind of open it up with Joe Wong. Joe Wong has a distinctive, uh, well, or maybe light accent, right? So Chinese have been around here for over 100 years. Why are they still an immigrant population? So that's an intriguing question. I'd like you to answer that. Uh, write it down. Write down your answer. Think of it in your mind. Why is it Chinese are still a dominant immigrant population? All right, so uh, the Chinese are an immigrant population primarily still because of exclusionary laws. We talked about in 1882, they excluded all Chinese, and the 1882 Exclusion Act, right, excluded all Chinese from coming to the United States. It really wasn't until the 1965 Immigration Act or the Hart Seller Act that enabled everyone, actually, uh, equally to come to the United States. And that was pushed by one ethnic group, and I want you to write this down, star this, right? What civil rights 1960s ethnic group pushed for the 1965 Immigration Act? Think of Malcolm X, think of MLK. It was the African Americans, right? So write that down. That, that was actually one of the reasons why Chinese um, population, actually, and Latino population increased in the United States um, directly because of African American activism, okay? Well, uh, because of that, if you come post-1965, uh, most Chinese families are still, um, there's still people who speak uh, Chinese in that family, as well as these Asian Latino families, right? So it's not just Chinese. So because of that, it, it, the bulk, the large majority of Chinese here are actually immigrants, right? First or second generation, very rarely third or fourth because of the exclusionary laws. And remember, the, the, the Chinese that were here in the 1800s were primarily males, right? So they can reproduce 
produce with each other. Um, also, remember there was a lot of uh, racial uh, kind of uh, racial uh, activities where they're driven out of certain places, so didn't really have a time to have families. All right, so that's the answer. That's the reason why Chinese are primarily still an immigrant population, and there's still more immigrants coming today. Okay. So a huge thing, of course, is exclusion of, of Chinese in America, okay? Now let's answer number three together. Early immigrants from Canton to work in the blank. What do they work in the? What? So let's think. All over America, where do they, what do they work at? What? So I know you have the answer correct. It was the railroads, okay? So yes, the early uh, immigrants that came, they worked in the railroads. So the ones in the mainland work in the railroads, the ones in Hawaii, what do they work in? So I know I have some Hawaiian students probably in the class. They worked in the sugar canes, right? So you see the different Chinese uh, groups, they worked. And the Chinese group uh, that were in Hawaii actually had a much easier time. There were more women and uh, more incorporated. And the, um, it was a huge uh, Pacific Islander Asian uh, majority. And so didn't have the racial strife that they, they had in LA, for instance, or San Francisco. All right, number four, most of these early Chinese male soldiers died alone without any descendants. So that's a, another reason why the Chinese are actually an immigrant dominant community. All right, so we'll talk about that. Let's talk about legal exclusion creates Chinatown. So let's think right now. Do you live in a Chinatown? Were you raised in a Chinatown? Have you been to Chinatown? Okay. Uh, do you live in Ethnoburb? Ethnoburb is a, a suburb that is an ethnic uh, base. Uh, near Cal Poly, we have something like Hycena Heights or Monterey Park, and those are ethnic kind of Asian, Latino uh, ethnoburbs. Uh, but some people argue it's like a Chinatown. All right, number one. So I, I want you to think, I don't have the answer, but I want you to write down this question. Is it good to live in a Chinatown? Okay. Now, one, Chinese, like most non-Anglo Americans, were redlined. So in my regular, in my regular classes, we'll actually have a huge conversation about redlining, and we'll actually go through all the different places in California, pretty much like near um, Cal Poly, and we'll talk about where who was allowed to where, live here, who was allowed to hear here. Okay, so redlining means that you were not allowed to live in certain parts of the city, and you were <clears throat> quote redlined. You had to live in certain areas. So Chinatown was a creation because actually the Chinese were not allowed to live in other parts of the city. So they're redlined. They're legally not allowed to live in certain parts, okay? So Chinatown is a creation. It is a spatial creation that was, that's the only place they can live, okay? Now, when you see a Chinatown globally around the world, that is often sometimes a bad, you can argue it's a bad sign or it's a good sign. Someone can write a paper on this, uh, but generally, they're not incorporated in society, right? So some people would argue that it is not a good sign if there's a Chinatown. It just means that the surrounding uh, community d does not accept them. And so they create, they have to create their own kind of fictitious land uh, called Chinatown, right? Um, so very interesting. Uh, that would be a good paper. Uh, we're writing a paper in our class on um, some aspect of your, your ethnic identity. So you could do it on where you live. And is Chinatown a good or bad thing? All right, intra-group diversity. So here Min Zhao is talking about the Chinese, and she's talking about the diversity within the Chinese, right? There's lots of diversity in the, um, in the Chinese community. But let me just keep going. All right. First, I want to define intra-group. What does intra-group diversity mean? Intra is defi what's it, a definition of intra. So in, 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 uh, the, the opposite antonym would be outside, right, extroverted. Intra means within, right, so that's in, within, group diversity. So we're talking today about the Chinese diversity in America. There's a huge within, intra, uh, there's a lot of diversity, right? So globally, we have over 22% of the people on the planet, uh, remember, one out of one, two, three, four, five planet uh, is Chinese globally, right? So you have 1.3 uh, billion people in China, but all over the world, they're in 150 countries out of 170, there are Chinese people, right? So those Chinese people will actually re-immigrate to the United States. So within our Chinese America, there's a huge intra-diversity, okay? So number one, before World War II, the Chinese were a bachelor society, okay? So write that down in your notes. 
right? And I, I'd like to ask you, what actually uh, gender group were they primarily? So before World War II, what were they generally? Thinking about who's building the, the, the railroads. So if you answered males, you are correct, okay? Now after 1965, we talked about the epic, very important 1965 act, right, that opens up uh, the immigration to everyone equally. The population drastically changes, right? So here I, I'm filming this at Cal Poly. And when I stare at my students at Cal Poly, I always ask them, when did your family come? And they'll often say 1980s, 1970s, right? Nobody says before 1965. It's generally very rare, right? So really, this act, 1965 act, would have completely changed Cal Poly to something else, right? To a different ethnic group, um, most likely. And even America, right? The, all of America. So the 1965 act, please star it, circle it, uh, underline it. That's the most important act. I want you to know you must know this act. It, yes, it will be on the test. It will be in the midterm. It will be in the final, okay? You have to know the 1965 Heart Seller Act, which made immigration equal to every ethnic group. Okay, so it completely changes America. And the two ethnic groups um, I'm going to ask you uh, who took advantage most of the 1965 Immigration Act are two what? Write it down. So think it. What are the two ethnic groups that the 1965 Immigration Act brought in that took most advantage of it? Although pushed by African Americans, who was it? Give it five seconds. All right. So it was Latinos and Asians, right? Latinos and Asians most took advantage of the 1965 immigration that completely changed the, the Latino population as well as the Asian population and for our class, the Chinese ethnic population. But how? Okay. So let's take, a, let's take another minute. I'd like you to answer. How did the population, and you can also, if you have time, you can do the Latino population as well. How did the population, the Chinese population, change? How did the racial makeup change of America? How did the class of the Chinese uh, change? The gender, ethnicity, okay? How did it change? So let's take one minute for you to answer all those questions. Okay, so let's answer it together, okay? All right, so the first way that the population changed, Menzel argues, is that it became much more diverse, right? So suddenly we had an um, Anglo-European population majority, and then you have increasing minorities, right? And the minorities that are increasing were primarily Latino and Asian, right? So if you look at now, you can see these demographic changes. And this year, 2013, is an epic magical year, right? This year in California, we have 39% Latino, and guess what? 39% Anglo-European, exactly equal, okay? So it really makes you want to think, like, what is dominant society in California, right, if you're arguing assimilation? If we have equal, uh, now we have all minorities, but uh, the equal, which is the dominant society in the United States, Anglo, 39% and 39%, and if anyone looks and takes Chicano study classes, you know there is a large, actually undocumented population, right? So one can argue that it might be higher or lower. Uh, it's up to you. But so again, of course, number one, how does it change? The population completely changes, right? And uh, this year, it's actually 39% Latino and 39% uh, Anglo. That's huge, right? That is something that uh, probably. Um, your kids will talk about later, right, um, what they think of as dominant society. So for, within the Chinese population, this obviously changed in, them in terms of coming to America that very much changed the demographics, uh, and Asian Americans are the fastest growing population in the United States, okay? So racially, we talked about Latinos and Asians primarily came. Later, uh, actually now, we actually have more African immigrants from Africa, um, so that is, uh, there's like new uh, visa requirements. So the class. So there's a huge class difference now between, um, between actually the old Chinese uh, immigrants and the new Chinese immigrants. Now you think of the old Chinese immigrants, they were from Canton, primarily illiterate, primarily uh, bachelors, they might have had a family there but they came here by themselves. And 
lot of them actually were not rich. In, in fact, the majority were not rich, right? Uh, they came to make a, a dollar and go right back, right, to go back to China. And so that is, so they, the first original Chinese had no intention of staying in America, right? They, they dreamed about going back to uh, uh, China. They dreamed about reuniting with their family. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of uh, negative things happened with the Chinese Exclusion Act, and some were stuck. They didn't have money to go back, and some were kidnapped. So the new population of Chinese are drastically different, okay? Let's, let's write down 10 ways why the Chinese are drastically different now than ones that are immigrating. Now, we, we began the opener with Joe Wong. Now, he doesn't look like it, but Joe Wong is, uh, has a PhD, actually. Uh, I think in like, something like chemistry or physics. Uh, so, number one, the actual Chinese currently now are literate. Okay, that's, that's a big difference. Uh, they are educated, right? They're, uh, they're, uh, that, that is a huge thing. So, often they come for PhDs, like Joe Wong. But um, also, a lot of them uh, are actually not from China. Some of them are from Hong Kong, some of them from Taiwan. Some are, are from double minorities we talked about. Some are the ones who went to Vietnam uh, after War II and now re-immigrated here back to LA or something, or actually more Orange County. The ones who went to Peru and Ecuador, the Chinese, and immigrated back here, and so they speak Spanish, et cetera. So there's huge interdiversity within the Chinese uh, community. It really makes you think, what is really Chinese? Because, and again, it, later on when we talk about the, the bleep Chinese-ness by Alan Chung, we'll talk about how they're really like Chinese is just a feeling because we're talking about 100 we're talking about 100 300 billion people uh 100 1.3 billion people it's uh it's a uh, contextual uh, what is really Chinese. So in terms of gender, of course, we have many more females, right? And that is, of course, huge. We have families that we didn't have in the past. Ethnicity is, uh, of course, very diverse. Uh, you have Chinese from Burma, Chinese from Thailand, you have Chinese Hmong, etc. Chinese from the Philippines, uh, Chinese from France, it's huge, or Chinese Vietnamese, or even Chinese Israelis who've re-immigrated back to the United States or immigrated first time. So very interesting. Um, and also, so in the past, the Chinese were redlined to actually actually live in Chinatown, right? So we're going to answer the last one. Most Chinese concentrated in the West Coast, also in, in NYC, right? Uh, so they're talking about here, California, and also New York, and that is true. But it's actually changing. There's more Chinese spreading out. But also, um, they're not in, and the most important I want you to start is they're not living in Chinatowns, right? Uh, we can make a later argument. Um, is an ethnoburb a, a place of assimilation? If it's not, and we're going to have a, a whole actual lecture on that, ethnoburb, good or bad, okay? So that is also a huge difference, is that these Chinese now are not living in Chinatown. Um, pretty interesting, if you go to our L.A. Chinatown, they're actually not really Chinese. They're, they're, they're double immigrants. They're ch generally Vietnamese Chinese that have moved to Chinatown or Cambodian Chinese who've moved to Chinatown. So you actually hear... Uh, Vietnamese or Cambodian languages when you go there. Um, they're ethnically Chinese, but they've moved there, so very interesting. All right, so we talked, to, we answered these questions, the gender change, the race, there's more diversity. Uh, we talked about class, there's actually more diversity, more uh, educated. Uh, gender, we talked about, there's more women, okay? And in ethnicity, there's, um, there's a plethora of different parts of China. I've been to China 32 times, uh, and it's very diverse, right? No one there would actually identify as Chinese, just uh, completely diverse. Um, think of Americans and how, we, how diverse we are, but times that by a billion, and that's how diverse China is. Uh, people just speak 2,000 different languages, right? And so many different ethnic groups, it's nothing like what we think. So again, our talk on Chinese ethnic group is sort of an imaginary, right? Uh, great. All right, the saliency of ethnicity. All right, so take a look at the slide and write down what you see. So write down what you see. So number one, Min Zhao, she, she argues that there's all these new immigrants, right? They challenge these assimilation models, right? And if you look, any of you guys are social majors, I know people are listening, you're a social major, right? If you've read uh, gangs and parks and those classical 1920s assimilation models based on European immigrants, right, that first you come as an immigrant, you're not incorporated, second generation you become more incorporated. And third, you lose all your ethnic identity and you become, quote, American. It's called the American Ethnic uh, Identity Assimilation Model. So these constant new immigrants, they kind of, from uh, Latin America or Asia, they, they kind of, they kind of um, I would say, they challenge 
Okay, they challenge these assimilation models because we have people fourth generation that are, quote, not assimilated, right? And my last segment I wanted you to think about, there's people who have been here hundreds of years, let's say African-American, and are they treated like full assimilated Americans, right? Uh, what does that mean, okay? All right, so that's one of the arguments that Minzal does. These new immigrants, they challenge these assimilation models, okay? Now, number two, is a second generation likely to live in Chinatown? So in the class right now, raise your hand or write down, yes, I would like to live in a Chinatown. Okay, so yes or no, would you like to live in a Chinatown? Is that a good place? There's always like some students who currently live in Chinatown. All right, so I'm sure a majority of you have said no, you don't want to live in Chinatown. And I would ask, well, why don't you want to live in Chinatown? People would say, well, it's not assimilated, it's, it's not part of American culture, it's like its own bubble. Well, okay. But then I, I always challenge that student, well, a lot of you guys live in the San Gabriel Valley, okay? San Gabriel Valley, let's say Glendora, Alhambra, um, Monterey Park, uh, Rosemead, those are ethnoburbs. Ethnoburb is an ethnic enclave. People call it just a suburban Chinatown, so, or a suburban, let's say, Latino area, okay? Because it's primarily Asian Latino. Is that assimilation? Do you want to live there? Is that a good model? So uh, is that incorporation? Okay. And again, with the demographic change this year with 39% Latino, is there a place? Uh, what is dominant society? Again, I don't have the answer. It's up to you to think about it. Uh, what is dominant society? Where should you live? Is an ethnoburb a good place for you to live? Okay. It's primarily minorities uh, in these ethnoburbs, uh, particularly in the San Gabriel Valley. Okay. Is that good or bad? Um, are you, are, is that a, a, an example of you're not assimilated, right? If you're living in Monterey Park, and Monterey Park is, I think, 60% Chinese and maybe 30% uh, uh, Latino, maybe 10% Anglo and African American, is that a good thing here? Is, is that good to live in there? Okay. So again, I don't have the answers. Um, that would be a good paper for you to write the pros and cons of living in Ethnoverb or enc Enclave. Um, so here I, I like to point out the San Gabriel Valley. So if you're from, let's say, Cal State Fullerton or Cal State LA, this class is open to all the Cal States, I want you to take a look. Um, San Gabriel is an actual area that is actually, uh, one could argue, it's primarily um, ethnic minorities. Uh, El Monte, these places are more, either primarily more Latino, Asian, or more primarily uh, Asian Latino. So you're looking at El Monte, Diamond Bar, Arcadia, Rosemead, Hycena Heights, okay? Those are ethnic enclaves, uh, or eth excuse me, uh, um, I, I want to say ethnoburbs because they're suburbs. Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Should we be more integrated? Um, this is something you something to think about, right? Or even can we be integrated, right? Can we be integrated, right? Uh, we talked about last time, we if you look at South Central, South Central was primarily Anglo-American, right? Then uh, Jewish Americans came in, so there was like, a little bit of white flight. And then African Americans were actually uh, uh, suing the city to actually move in, to break the red line, to move into uh, South Los Angeles. When they finally moved in, once a community turns 20% minority, boom, there will be a flight. So there was a huge white flight out of actual... Um, out of South, uh, South Central, right? So they became primarily a, Ju a Jewish vendors and African Americans, right? And so then th we had, uh, that was historically there for a long time. And then we had the LA riots, et cetera, and we'll talk about that later, okay? Uh, and then after the LA riots, and even before the LA riots, actually in, before 92, there's, after the 1965 Immigration Act, we had more and more Latinos actually moving in to, uh, to South Los Angeles. So what did, it, what did occur? Black flight, yes. So one of you listening to this, I hope you can write that book because that's happening cur uh, currently now. Um, people always say, can we get along? Well, right now, 2013, uh, lots and lots of African Americans. Well, it started uh, before, right before the 92 riots, but if, the, if you are a middle class or upper middle class African American, uh, if you had the means, you bought actually a home and you moved, you sold your home in South Los Angeles and you moved. Where did you move to, guys? Some of you probably live there. We, we grow oranges there. Where, where, where did the, the black flight occur? Okay. 
U C R U C Riverside. So Riverside, yeah. So now there's a huge African American flight actually out of South Los Angeles into Riverside. It's been happening for a couple decades now, right? So it begs the question: Can we get along? We've had black flight, Jewish flight. We had originally a white. Uh, white. Well, if we went back, we actually um, uh, actually they killed off the Native Americans. But anyway. Uh, not talking about that, that that's horrific, but um, that was actually legal, that was illegal, legal. but in terms of voluntary leaving, we had white flight, we had Jewish flight, we had now currently 2003, we had black flight, okay, so it seems like there is, uh, it's hard to get along uh, for these different ethnic groups. So again, is again, this is something that I don't have an answer to, but I want you to think about is, is this good? Is it bad to live in an ethnic group? And can you even get along in an ethnic group, right? Because looking at South Los Angeles, uh, when the different ethnic groups got together, people are leaving. People are leaving and running away, okay? So pretty interesting. All right, so now let's take a break. So we talked a little bit about the demographics of Chinese America and the intra-diversity. So let's take a break, and I'll see you in a few minutes.